for TV event out here. <laughs> well, good morning. Good morning. We're gonna, good morning, everyone. We're going to jump back into our series on free. Um, as we already know um, by now, today is Palm Sunday. For most of my life, I would look at the calendar and it said Palm Sunday, and I just thought that meant a beach day, you know, because I lived in <laughs> South Florida and I figured Palm and you be. I know, I know. I, I didn't know any better. I didn't know any better. But but I know now that Palm Sunday represents a very holy day in our faith. It represents a very holy day in the life of Jesus as we enter into Passion Week. Um, it's a very special time. We're in we're in we're stepping into Passover, stepping into Good Friday. And then the day and the event that our faith rides on is Resurrection Sunday, the day that Jesus rose. And Scripture reveals to us the historic significance of Palm Sunday. It was the day that, that you know, I always looked at an event where maybe hundreds of people, but it was literally thousands, ten thousands. I was reading somewhere where they thought maybe even up to 100,000, 250,000 Israelites lined the road, the rocky, hilly road from Bethany to Jerusalem with palm branches to welcome Jesus, as Blake said, on a, on a donkey. And I didn't know what that meant, but, but, a, but a, a donkey signified that he was coming in peace, where a horse would have signified that he was coming in war. And the word, and we, we sang the song this morning, the word that's most associated with Palm Sunday is this phrase that they were chanting to Jesus, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that word, Hosanna, we taught on this last year. Um, the, the Hebrew word for this, a very rich word, is Hosayana. Hosayana. And it literally has two meanings. It means help, and not just, you know, you see people on the corner, you know, hold a sign that says, please help. Not that help, it means help. Help! But it also means, I see my help coming. It's also we're rejoicing. I see my help coming. It's like you're drowning in the ocean. The riptide's taking you out. You see the dorf, dorsal fins swimming around. You're like, help! Help! But then you see your lifeguard. And you don't even care if it's David Hasselhoff in the, in the Speedo from Baywatch. Like, that's your help. Your help is coming. That joke just totally fell flat. <laughs> I digress. Amen. That's the way they saw Jesus coming. It's like, we need help. Our help is coming. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And we have this rich symbolism of the laying of these, of these, of these palms, which was customary for for, a, for the, the homecoming of a king, the homecoming of a, of a great warrior. And basically what they're saying to Jesus is, help us, free us. Why did they need to be free? Because they weren't. And that's where I'm merging the lane of, of Palm Sunday into our series on being free because the Israelites knew what it was like to be held captive. They knew what it was like to be slaves, but they also knew what it was like to have dramatic rescue. This is Passover, by the way. This is the season they were in of Passover, which was, was the time when God came miraculously, and all those who were under the literal blood of the Lamb were spared while the angel of death ravished their Egyptian cap captives. Exodus. The Exodus. Yeah. The story of the Exodus. It was a miraculous saving. It's why they celebrate the Passover. And now here they are. They find themselves under Roman rule. They find themselves under the harsh hand of Caesar. They find themselves under the governance of Herod, who was just maniacal enough to, to kill all the firstborn boys. And they see Jesus coming, and they see their help. It's like they see the promise of God that I'm going to send a Messiah, that I'm going to send a Savior, and here he comes on a donkey. And what they miscalculated was just how dramatic this rescue was. You see, it wasn't about just one government or one tribe or one people or one nation. What God was doing in Holy Week, the work that Jesus was on his way to do, was to free all oppression, was to break the governance of all evil, and where we're going today, to break 
the lie of sin. Amen. What overturns any lie? The truth. The truth. A lie cannot stand up to truth. And Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. He said, if my words abide in you, meaning if you listen to what I say, if you do what I'm teaching you to do, he said, then you will know the truth, and the truth will what? Set you free. It will set you free. And he who the Son sets free is what? Free indeed. Free indeed. Jesus was coming in truth. He was very upfront about his ministry. He was coming to say, set the captives free. Isaiah prophesied about it. And in Jesus' first sermon, basically, that's what he said. I have come to set the captives free. It's like birds aren't meant to live in a cage. They're not meant to be held captive to a cave. And mankind is not meant to be held captive to a lie. And to find the root of the lie, we have to go all the way back to the beginning. You see, the same set of lies that ensnared mankind in the garden is the same set of lies, the same beginning of lies that is ensnaring some of us today. God said, you can have everything you want of the garden. In fact, I'm setting you here to govern over it. You want to hear something cool? He said, you can be fruitful and multiply. You know what that means, right? Come on, people, are we alive today? He said we could be fruitful and multiply. Come on, hallelujah. But he said, he said you can have everything you want, but don't eat of this tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, lest, he didn't just leave it there, he explained it. He said, lest your eyes be open, that you will surely die. And here comes the serpent, planting the lie. This is where the lie entered. This is the root of all lies right here. He said, did he really say that? And he's like, yeah, he said, we don't eat from this tree. So he continued. Little white lies turn into big lies. He said, are you really going to die? You know, I know he's just holding back from you. He just doesn't want you to be like him. You see, he couldn't defeat them. He had no authority to defeat him. So what he did was he hacked the system. He implanted a lie. He hacked the operating system. And the lie was this. God is not loving. God is not truthful. God is not righteous. God is not gracious. It was character assassination against God. It's just plain old assassination for us. That's what the lie meant for us. And what he was trying to do was to get us separated from God. What he was trying to do is get us on another path away from God, to get us sunk, to get us stuck. And what it means for us today, this is where we find ourselves in the lie today, is this. It gets us away from doing things God's way. We're saying we can't trust him fully, so we're going to have to do it our way. And that's the problem. And it was a hack. He implanted a virus, a parasite. It was, it was malware. Anybody ever use a computer with malware on it? Mm-hmm. All you Windows people. See, I'm on a Mac, and they don't have malware. It's like the saint of computers. You know, it's just like, it just works. It work. it, there's no malware. But I've seen an infected Mac. <laughs> I digress, Mac. I digress. <laughs> you can't clean an infected Mac. No, actually, my son got malware on one of my apples, so it is possible, but it takes... it takes. So what malware is, is an infection. It's usually because you went somewhere you shouldn't have gone and clicked on something you probably shouldn't have, and it still works. It still boots up. The screen, screen still comes on. Things still click. It still prints. But something sinister is happening on the inside. You see, instead of just serving the owner... Now the computer is being is serving the hacker on the other end. You following me? See see what I'm doing? See what I'm doing here? See what I'm doing here? And what happens is your identity is being stolen. Your information is being stolen. What you're trying to accomplish, where you're trying to go, it's being redirected to serve somebody else. Wow. It begins to slow you down. Your 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 function begins to slow down. Even though it works, you can still play Candy Crush, right? But you can't accomplish anything 
Good. What happens when a lie is planted in us? What happens when malware is implanted in us? Anybody ever live a lie? I know, I know that's a rhetorical question. Like we all have, right? We've all been stuck living within a lie. When I was growing up, I had a friend of the family, and he decided along the way that he would have better luck picking up girls if he could fake a British accent. <laughs> like he was going to do the whole James Bond. Guys, promise me you're not going to try this. All right, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to put this out there, but I mean, don't don't. So he began to practice, you know, in the mirror, like this whole like I'm going to have a British accent thing. And guess what? It worked. So he was going he was going to the bars. He was going to the club, doing this whole James Bond thing. He's got this British accent. I mean, I don't want to glorify this too much. When I say it worked, it worked so good. He met the girl of his dreams. Wow. And she loved his accent. And she was smart, and she was beautiful, and she was funny. And this was Palm Beach. Her family was loaded. Loaded. So he found himself in a little bit of a conundrum. Before long, they were living together. So his little ruse at night turned into a 24-7 thing. She would ask him, like, you know, you sound a little different in the morning. And he would just play it off. And on the other end, he's telling his friends, like, hey, if you run into me, don't be surprised if I'm talking this way. And sure enough, he would run into people he hadn't seen in forever, and he'd be, like, talking to them. And he'd be looking at them, like, what in the world? And he's like... <laughs> but when you live a lie, it's eventually going to come to a head, right? Because it's not going to set you free. No. And so there was a dinner party at the family's compound. Oh. And one of the family members was, was a Brit. Oh. And he had heard about my friend. Oh. Oh. And he began to talk to him. And he, and he heard the way he was speaking. He said, where, where did you say you're from? Oh. What did you say that you did? Oh. And he, sure enough, he marched over to the dad. He said, this guy's a phony. He's a fake. They told the girl, and she left them like that. Some of us, people in the world, are drowning in lies that they're living. You've got men and women in, in affairs that are just, they know they're just one misstep away from everything going poof. You have CEOs that are, that are carrying on Ponzi schemes, knowing that someday soon, they, no matter what they do, eventually their penthouse is going to become the jailhouse. You have politicians so caught up in scandals, and they just know the day is going to come when the press says, gotcha. And then you have some of us, little white lies, like, oh, I'm going to try a British accent. We get caught up in these little white lies, and we just have to carry them on into even more and more lies. Wow. I wrote this down. They bruise character. They violate trust. They erode truth. They diminish our values. They recruit dishonesty. And what's worse is we begin to live them. We, get, we begin to believe our own lies. Has anybody ever known somebody that just, they just believed their lie? It became their path. I know it's none of us, but we know some people like this, right? It's like they believe their lie. They've been living it so long that they believed it so much it became their path in life. And Proverbs says there's a, there's a path before each person that seems right, but it leads to death. There's a path that seems right to man, but it leads to death. And the message, it says there's a way of life that looks harmless enough. Look again. It leads straight to hell. Sure, those people appear to be having a good time, but all that laughter mm -hmm. will end in heartbreak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been on a path that seemed right? Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Have you ever gone down a road and it's like everything looks good, it looks right, and before you know it, it's like things don't look good, things don't, kids roll up the yes. windows, lock yes. the doors, we are not where we are supposed to be. Uh -huh. In the garden, it said, it said that tree was pleasing to the eye. It said the fruit looked good to eat. Uh -huh, it seemed right. Yes. It seemed good. Yes. 
So they ate of it, and sure enough, it says their eyes were open. And immediately it's like, we're naked. And they're ashamed. And now they're hiding. And there's this guilt. Their eyes were open. Some of us, it's like we've been going down these paths. We thought they were right, but we knew somewhere they were based on a lie. They were probably based on that lie from so long ago. That just evolved and just evolved and just evolved. And they caught up with and we're walking in it. And all of a sudden we're like, we're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. Yeah. Right? Can I, be, can I be harsh for a second? Can I be blunt for a second? Please. This ain't Kansas. No. This ain't Kansas. Right. Nobody, nobody went to bed as a child and said, I hope I end up in a tent for the rest of my I hope I end up in a pole barn with a bunch of snorers and a bunch of crazy people. Nobody. Nobody. That, nobody that was... This is the path of a lie. We need to see Jesus coming and saying, Save me. Yes. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes. Save me. Help me. Help me. I see my help coming. So I want to draw a line in the... Well, it's not sand. It's like... I want to draw a line in the, as, in the asphalt this morning. So you got to work with what you got. I want to draw a line, and I want to look at two different paths and two different destinations, okay? Two different paths, two different destinations. I don't care who you are and what you believe. We, we all can agree on this. There is a destination. Yes. That in life, there's going to be some finality, that there's going to be some sort of destination. And, and I would argue that there's a path that leads to God, and there's a path that leads away from God. There's a path that leads to the end by design, and another one, the, the path that leads to default. There's one that you really want to be on, and there's one you really, 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 really don't want to be on. The path to eternity, the path everlasting, is paved in truth. It's paved in righteousness. We can't do it on our own. Who do we need? Who did it for us? And he said, follow me. He said, follow me, but there's another path. And it's paved in a lie. It's paved in, paved in, I've been saying paved. 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 It's easy. Time out. I got the sun on me, you know? It's like, okay. I can do this. I'm the pastor. I can stop. I can take a drink. All right, Apostle. Amen. It's paved. It's paved. Look, nobody, nobody decided to go down the wrong road. Nobody said like, hey, the car, you see the bumper sticker says, follow me as I go to hell. No, it's based on deception. It's based on, it's based on seduction. You know the word seduction? Lies seduce us. Sin seduces us. It's based on that same old stupid lie from the beginning that God cannot be trusted. It's based that God that we can't be. And look at me, look at me. It's based on this. God can't be trusted, so I got to go it alone. I got to do it myself. That's the lie. And that's where the error comes in. And we're talking about being free. That's the whole series. We're talking about being free. And the only way you're going to be free is if you're walking in truth, you're walking in righteousness. We know what truth is. What is righteousness? Right standing with God. Righteousness is doing it God's way. Yeah. Amen. Right? right. <laughs> you got it, brother. You got it. Preach it, man. Preach it. Righteousness... Righteousness is doing things God's way. My, my old pastor used to say this. He said, there's two ways to do anything in life. God's way and any other way. God's way and any other way. And God gives us so much freedom with our lives. It's not like he's got us on a short lease. It's not like he's got us on a choker chain. He lets us free. Even when you, you ever have a dog, you take them off the chain and they just take off. That's us. He take, you take the leash off and we run up, but he knows, he knows we'll be back. Prodigal or whatever it takes, he knows that we will come back. So if, if righteousness is doing it God's way, what is sin? Sin is the opposite of righteousness. Sin is not doing it God's way. 
And I don't want to minimize sin. Sin, sin is corrosive. It's destructive. Yes. It ruins everything. Uh -huh. But so many people have just yelled at you, sin, 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 sin. Yes. Let's humanize this for a second. What is sin? Sin is deciding I'm going to do it, not God's way. Yeah. I'm going to do it my way. And I, one thing I've learned, I mean, take all the religion out of it. Just my time and my, uh, most of my life I was atheist or agnostic. What I've learned, truthfully speaking, what I've learned in ministry, in my own testimony, in my own life, is this, that I, if I do things like God wants me to do, and I walk in that from one step to the next, God's, God wants me to do it this way and that way, I become more free. I prosper. It doesn't mean everything's perfect. I'm not trying to sell you a, a, a bill of goods here. But you will become more and more happy, stable, fruitful, and blessed. Amen. So that you may be a blessing. And what I've also learned, this is how I found God, that if I don't do it God's way, I begin to drift. And I'm not prospering. And I'm not being blessed. And if I do it long enough, I'm on this other path, and I'm going the wrong way, in the wrong direction. So I just want to, as we close today, I just want to, it's like, what is God's way of doing things? We could do a whole series on that. I just want to give you a few this morning of things that God says, do it my way. God has instructed us that our bodies are not our own, that we are a temple, that we are, that we are a tabernacle for him to live in us. Yes. Therefore, he wants us to take care of our bodies. Yes. Amen. <laughs> I like this guy. He wants us, so you know, he wants us to eat a certain way. Yes. Did you know if you ate the food that God had for you, I can't believe Chris is walking away. This is like, this is like Chris and Chris, will you come take your shirt off? No? No, he, come on, puff up a little. Did you put the baby oil? Did you know if you ate the food that God intended for you to eat, the fruit that the, the food that comes from the trees, that comes uh -huh. from the ground, yes. the animals that roam, did you know that you will be clear, that you will be strong, that you will be healthy, you won't be all burdened by diseases? Yes. You will be pure. You will your body, your temple will be as God intended. Yes. It doesn't work that way with Big Macs. It doesn't work that way with Twinkies. I can give you this analogy. For 40 years of my life, I fell into the lie of that I am going to live to eat. That I just eat whatever it is that I, whatever is pleasing to me, I'm going to eat. What did that end up with me? I was 60 pounds overweight. I had hypertension, high blood pressure. I was pre-diabetic. I was tired. I was sore. I was a mess. It was a problem. Yes. The doctor said, you're a Christian, right? I said, yeah. Eat what God has for you. End of story. Go back three months later, lost 60 pounds. Awesome. No more hypertension, no more diabetes. Amen. God has a plan for us, yes. even with our food. God has a plan for your finances. Yes. It's called a piggy bank. Yes. No, I'm just kidding. All right. <laughs> God has a plan, but it comes with this idea that everything belongs to him. Yeah, man. Everything belongs to well, he's not the one that wakes up at 6.30 and the, you couldn't even tie your shoes two days in a row without him. Everything belongs to him and he, everything belongs, everything belongs to him and he wants you to be blessed. He wants you to be prosper, but not for the sake of error. Can you see how the enemy would seduce us with money? Yes. Have you looked in the world today? Money is the root of what? So, love of money. Love of money. Is there a love of money? Is there a lust of money going on in the world today? Of course there is. And we see the ramifications of that. So God says this, I'm going to bless you, but I have an exercise in place. I'm going to give you everything, and you're going to give me your first fruits. You're going to give me the best portion of the top the first fruits and some of us what we do is like well god i'm going to give you my leftovers i'm going to i have a little bit left i'm going to give you what i have if jesus came to your house would you invite him in your refrigerator and say you can have anything in tupperware yes. and you can have anything with aluminum foil on it no Why not? you have anything it all belongs to you 
God, God has a plan to deal with our struggles and our hardships. Our struggles and our hardships and our, and our, and our pain. He has a plan for that. It's like, go hustle up some change and buy beer. No. He, senses, he wants us to hustle up some faith and buy into him. Hustle up some faith and buy into him. And what, what he's saying is this. He's saying, stop, stop making your problems so big. Stop meditating on all your problems because you're magnifying them. You're making everything big, and conversely, you're making me small. Colossians 3 says, set your eyes, set your gaze on things above. And what he's saying to us is this. Put me in the right proportion. Put the kingdom in the right proportion, and your problems will shrink right before your eyes. God has a plan for us relationally. Relationally, it's called Facebook and Gchat. No, God has called us into fellowship as a church, as a body. I know a lot of people live together, but isn't it different when you come together on Sunday? Isn't it different when we're here together? He called us into fellowship with the image of a body, with Jesus as the head. Jesus as the head. You're not the head. The idea that you think you're the head is the lie from way back then. That's the, you're not the head. You make a terrible head, an awful head. But you are the body, and you have a part, and you have a role, and you have a function. Some of us are feet, some of us are hands, and yes, some of us are butts. But you know what? we got to sit on something. Amen. 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 <laughs> we got to sit on something. And God has given us the holy sacrament of marriage. So much has, has been said about that now, but man and woman come together, they cleave together with Jesus as the third cord. Not that we look like Kanye and Kim, but we look like the bridegroom and the church. That's God's plan. So let me end, let me end like this. Being free, being free in our lives means this doing things in truth, and doing things God's way. Amen. If you Amen. want to be free, you're going to have to do things God's way. Spiritually, emotionally, relationally, professionally, you're yes. going to have to do it God's way. Yes. And Jesus summed it up very well, like, better than I could ever come up with. In Matthew 7, he says, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide for though for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult. And only a few ever find it. Friends, it's much easier to just drift along. It's much easier to just follow where the party's going. You know why? Because anything goes. Anything goes. Taking the narrow path is, is more difficult. Why? Because only one thing goes. When you take the narrow path, I'm going to do things as God said to do them. Taking the narrow path means I'm going to make a choice. I'm going to make a commitment. It means I'm going to be humble enough to say, I can't even do this alone. I can't even do this without Jesus. Jesus, I am following you. But the lie, the lie is that the wide path stays the wide path. The lie is that the wide path leads to life. The lie is that the, that the party is just going to keep going on yes. and keep going on. And the lie is this. It's like, yeah, the on-ramp is big. But once you swerve onto that thing, you find out real quick that, hey, they haven't paved this thing in a while. There's a lot of traffic. There's a lot of crazy drivers out there. Yeah. And you know what? Why, as I keep going, I keep, why do I keep having to merge? Where are the lanes going? Yes. All of a sudden, what seemed like a wide path is a very narrow, a very constricted path. Yep. Yes. And yes, the, 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 the narrow gate. Yes, it's narrow. But the more you walk in it, and the more areas of your life that you give over to doing things God, God's way, the more free you get. Yes. The more free you get, the more the road opens up. Amen. Yes. And the more free. We want to be free. We're made to be Woo! free, church. And walking in freedom means walking in truth and doing things God's way. I'm going to end it right there. Amen. 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 Awesome. Thank you.